like to welcome a good friend of mine, one of the first business professionals I met when I moved to Squim, uh, Christy Rookard to the program. She has been with First Federal for quite some time, I will say, in many yes. different roles. Um, when I met you, you were, I think, the president of the Squim Chamber. You were the branch manager, and now you're like top dog vice president of uh, regional sales and distribution or something awesome. What's your official title? Yes, uh, it, you made it sound way better. It's regional manager, yep, VP, so in charge of all the branches in the network. Well, come on, of course, you got to be able to upsell yourself. I mean, in charge of all the branches, and that's a pretty big deal. For sure. I love it. Come a long way from being a humble personal banker, right? I started as a teller, for sure, yes. See, this is why I knew I liked you, because I started as a teller in college at Bank of America and worked for Bank of America for seven or eight years. So I knew that we had something in connection there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So as I can see, you are working from home like the rest of us. Yes. Um, tell me about that transition. How's that been from going from a, a lifetime of working in a banking center um, to this? Right. You know, it's in some ways it's kind of nice because you can just roll out of bed, go to the computer. Yes, for sure. Uh, not have to take a shower, but that's only interesting for maybe a week or so. <laughs> then you kind of want to look a little bit better, you know, get dressed, put your makeup on. But the biggest thing for me other than that is um, the interaction with the other staff members um, and the customers and seeing the customers, it's, it's so bizarre because you know, our um, branches are open through the drive through So when I have gone into the branches to see how people are doing, it's bizarre not having customers inside the branch lobby. Um, so, so that part I miss, I miss the people. So the, the relaxed atmosphere is nice for a little bit, but it gets old. What's one thing you have found out about yourself while you've been kind of locked down? I mean, I think that a lot of us have had some realizations of different hobbies or bad habits or different stuff. What's one thing personally about you that you've discovered about yourself? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Um, I would say with, um, I'm pretty routine oriented. And so going to work, there's just a certain routine, you know, you, you have your coffee in your mug and you have this and you bring your lunch to work. Yes. Um, and so uh, it breaks that routine. And so um, either you eat more than you think you should, or you're like, Oh, it's been eight hours. I haven't eaten or something like that. So um, for me, it's, it's having um, not having that, um, that much of a routine at home. You don't have, um, you don't look at the clock nearly as closely. So, um, well, you don't, you don't have a five and six year old at home because we're constantly looking at the clock going, when is bedtime? <laughs> right. For sure. No, don't have any of that. Yep. No, no. Uh, the other thing is, um, it's, and you have to be careful about this is making sure that you, um, take time for yourself. It's very easy when your computer is set up at home, um, that you could just keep working. Uh, you know, just sitting at the computer and doing your thing. And so really making sure you turn it off, even though it's staring at you in your face and go for a walk or whatever. Yeah. I talked with a good friend of mine who's over uh, on the East coast. And he said the same thing is that he notices without his commute, even though his commute is only like 10 minutes each way, he said driving into work where he would like kind of ramp up and prep himself to go run his business. And then the drive home was always his decompress disconnect and like, Here's my 10 minutes to think through the day and then be present for the family. But when you're, you know, it's kind of the curse of these things too, when you're yes. kind of always connected, but like I can always sneak in and do two emails from my home office. It's like, it's hard to sometimes say, okay, now's when I'm working. Now's when I'm not. I, I feel you on that for one. Sure. Um, I had a question. If you can expand, obviously First Federal, huge uh, local bank on the peninsula area. Mm -hmm. You mentioned being close to foot traffic. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you've had with employees and transitioning and if some people are working from home and what, like, how's that worked with all the different departments? Right. So, um, anyone that can do their job from home is doing their job 
from home. So that was a big transition for several people, um, not only for the employees, but our um, outstanding IT department that got people set up at home. Um, but that was the mandate. If, if you didn't have to be um, in the office, then you know we were told, okay, we're gonna set you up at home. Um, the, the challenge, and, and most people can, um, that works for them, uh, the thing is, is we do have to have a few people in the branch for the drive-through. So what we've done um, to help the social distancing is they're on a rotation basis. So let's say you have five tellers, um, then, you know, one day there will be two or three, a different day it'll, you know, they rotate them around so that um, they get a chance to be um, home uh, and not be at the branch. Um, the entire time because it's kind of hard in the drive through to do social distancing when you've got two people right there. So we like to give that break um, on that. The, the thing that's really and I'm pretty excited about is it made us accelerate efficiencies for customers. So for example, opening accounts, traditionally people come into the branch. They can do it online, but most people don't. Yeah. Um, so we have made it very easy um, and use DocuSign, so e-signature for way more than we used to. And this just made it, because um, we kind of wanted to do that, and. Uh, this made us do it real fast. <laughs> so several um, items, the efficiencies and the ease for our customers, um, it just made it happen kind of overnight. Isn't that awesome that sometimes through like adversity or, you know, you're forced into it, you know, your mm -hmm. necessity required you to adopt a new way of doing business. And you know what, sometimes you drag your feet on, you don't want to do, it's like, yeah. well, shoot, two feet, we're jumping right in, we have to. And, right. uh, you know, for our business, we found the same thing. We always figured every single person would want to come in and sign wet pen on paper. But when given the option, it's like 50% of people are like, cool, just send me the email. Not a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the other big elephant in the room that I know has been huge in the banking world that I thought you would be awesome to ask and why I asked you to be on here specifically was about the Paycheck Protection Program. We've yes. all been seeing stuff on the news. Most small businesses, obviously businesses down either a lot or completely shut because of government mandate. And this program came out. Can you take like 60 seconds to explain it in a nutshell and then talk about how it has been for a small community bank to kind of figure this out? Right, so um, it's, a, it's a really great program for uh, businesses. The deal is, um, that when all the information came out, it was a ton of information coming from the SBA. However, the in, this is in the beginning. The SBA, let me just stop you for, and yes. dumb it down for those of us who aren't. SBA is what, Small Business Administration, is that yes. right? It's like yes. a, a lending platform for business. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I gotta break down all these acronyms and stuff and make sure that people that are watching at home understand what we're talking about. Sure. Yes, yes, um, that is what we're talking about. Uh, and, the thing is, is they were changing the rules on this program, um, not only every day, but by every hour in the beginning. So it was difficult for banks to finalize uh, programs in the beginning. And not every bank is an SBA lender. And so um, the banks that were not SBA lenders, were, which are most up here on the peninsula, are not, there are a few, um, had to, um, get this program in place with some sort of vendor in order to offer this um, to our small businesses um, in the community. And so it, we got that program running in less than a week um, once, you know, everything, um, it was uh, good to go. Um, given that, that first round of funding that came through, there um, was massive amount of businesses that were, um, uh, you know, wanting money. And the interesting thing is, is we anticipate if everything goes through for the second round, the dollar amounts will be lower because the big businesses got the bulk of the money the first round. Mm. Um, so 
for example, um, First Federal, uh, that first round, we were ready to go, um, but they shut off the funding. So when they got 27 loans through um, for about 7.26 million, However, um, we're teed up, which I'm thinking all banks are teed up at this point in time. And yeah. so when they do the green light, um, we're ready to basically just hit the submit button. And um, kind of, it's not a guarantee though, um, and we don't know how fast the money will go. I kind of think of what people could relate to in this area is like the duck derby you've got all these ducks and you open the floodgate, right? And they come rushing out trying to get to the end and some are gonna make it and some are not. Just because, you know, there's there's gonna be more need than money is available, we anticipate. Yeah. But we're ready. So when, it's, when they say go, we basically hit submit and then swims along. <laughs> yeah, it's such a, such a funny thing. I've talked to so many different people that have applied and it just seems like there was no true rhyme or reason as to who was approved, banks that were ready, banks that weren't ready. I've heard stories of huge banks that weren't ready, small banks that were, you know, all in between. Um, it just seemed like a total crapshoot with regards to, you know, who you applied with and when they applied and what was going on. Like you mentioned, sure. information was coming so quick to the banks that they're just like, you know, doing the matrix moves, trying to figure out what they need to do. Absolutely. So this round we have um, close to 300 applications, um, over 25 million ready to go. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. What were your thoughts? It obviously made big news about some of the big companies. Like, you know, obviously a lot of the companies that you're dealing with, you said 27 people for $7 million, like in the grand scheme of what was given out, that's peanuts. What right. did you think about when you heard big companies like Ruth's Chris, publicly traded companies like Shake Shack getting the money? Like what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I think there was some flaws in the initial setup of the program. Um, I will say that there um, was feedback um, given to when the, um, about that, the big companies um, getting, and that's why a lot of the money went so fast the first time is because those, those um, what they were requesting were huge amounts. So you, you can imagine why it went so fast. So one of the things they did this time uh, is they are allocating, uh, I have it written down here, about $30 billion of this um, go around to community banks that are less than 10 billion in asset size. So it gives the opportunity for banks like First Federal to have a better shot <laughs> with that allegation specific to the size of our bank. Well, that's good. I mean, it's good that's to hear. A, I mean, that's a change. I know that they were, and this is, you know, the Fed was coming up with this stuff on the fly as well. So, I mean, it's nice to see that they've seen some of the frustrations. If you watch that, I try to limit my news intake, but we try to watch the nightly news every couple of days. And when I see it, it's like it, it's so many, like you said, small mom and pops that just needed a little bit to stay afloat are getting nothing. Whereas these mega corporations are getting 10, 20 million. Um, okay. It just seems it seemed like there were a lot of flaws. So it's good to hear that they've obviously listened and tried to they remedy did. some of that. Absolutely. Um, what else is going on in your world with being on lockdown and managing all these people? Have you become like a part-time therapist with some of your employees having to make sure everyone's balancing happiness and stress and all that? Tell me about, tell me about that. Part right. of so it's, it's kind of different. Um, in, in the role that I do, typically what I would do, um, at least once a month, maybe more is I would go meet with the managers in person for at least half a day and, um, you know, go through the things that we needed to go through. So that's not, um, what we're doing right now. And so, um, what I do is, uh, once a week at least, I call it a care call to the manager and ask, um, you know, how things are going with their team, what the morale is like, how they are holding up um, and, uh, you know, see how it's going with the rotation of their staff. And um, so it's, it's a very different conversation um, in the, you know, when I have that one-on-one -on -one in person and not to say that, 
We don't talk about morale and how they're doing, but it's usually um, very focused on production, uh, sales, and those types of things. The focus is much different um, when we're doing these, um, you know, care calls. Um, it's more about how are you doing, how how's your balance with, um, you know, they're working sometimes from home, but um, not nearly as much because we need leadership at the branch, even though the drive through is open. Um, yeah, so it's very different um, types of conversations yeah. that we're having. It so makes they're, sense. They're it makes sense. Well. I mean, if the, if the culture is there and you're confident in like the day-to-day, -day, you don't have to like focus on that. But when this dark cloud is hanging there, there's a little bit more tension to like, well, just how are, how are you? Right. Right. Um, I have one last question. This is a personal one. We'll divert from business. What is one thing that you are just totally looking forward to once this is over with and you get back to being able to go to groups? Is it eating a big juicy burger at your favorite restaurant? I'm assuming something to do with your, you know, your grandkids. I mean, what's something that you're just desperate to get to? For sure. Well, I have not social distanced myself from my grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. We were, not we were with each other from the beginning, so uh, um, that would have been super hard. Yeah. Um, I think the the biggest thing for me, though, is I want to be with my friends. <laughs> we miss it so bad. I know. Just being together, maybe uh, going out to have a cocktail after work or some. Um, uh, we had a group of ladies that, you know, at one point was doing hikes or yoga or something on um, certain nights of the week. Um, so just really miss that social interaction with um, my friends. Yeah, it's something I think a lot of us have taken for granted. And even though you got more free time now, it's uh, I think that we will all enjoy those first hugs and high fives and handshakes once things get, you know, hopefully back to normal. So um Thank you so much. I know you're a very, very, very busy person, so I appreciate you taking the time out to jump on here. Hopefully, I can uh, do you proud and edit it up to make you sound even smarter and more educated than you are. Awesome. Um, but again, thank you so much, and thanks to First Federal for all that you guys do for our community, and uh, I can't wait to see you debut on the Clallam Corner. Awesome. Thank you, James. All right. Thanks, Christy. Okay.